Do you want to know how to build a classification yard for your model railroad? Why don't you stick around and see how we did it on the Sayhurst Secondary Mayan Scale Model Railroad. Hello everyone, Joe from Central Jersey Conrail and Inscale. Welcome back. This is episode 23 of our construction series. So I'm standing here to, uh, in front of you today and I'm happy to report that this will be our final uh, video of our construction playlist. So as you can see over behind me, uh, Brown's Yard is uh, about 95% complete. Um, also in this video, um, it's going to be a little bonus for you. Um, we constructed uh, a Amboy engine facility as well. Um, and as you see, you'll see in a few minutes, uh, I'll tell you why. But so initially I was gonna do episode 23 and episode 24 and then wrap it up. But um, the way the construction laid out uh, in the process, it was just easier and to just put it all together. And I figured let's just put it all in one big video and go out with a bang. So um, why don't you kick back and relax and uh, watch how we put together the yard and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it and uh, we're also going to talk about what's coming up sh uh, soon. Okay, so here we are getting started. So the first step I wanted to get done uh, before you started putting down cork in Brown's yard is I wanted to hit all these joints and get them nice and smooth and then I'll go ahead and vacuum up all my dust. Okay, so for my road bed, I decided to use cork sheets instead of cork road bed. And um, if you look at these pictures here of uh, Brown Yard that I took back in 94, you can see that the tracks are all kind of level. There's not much relief in between each track. So that's what I want to represent here. And I thought by using uh, Details West uh, cork sheets uh, and putting them all, butting them all up to, together, there wouldn't be any relief and be nice and flat. So during the process, I wanted all my cork to be nice and uh, flat and level. Um, so originally, I was going to skip Amboy engine facility and come back to it. But then I realized, you know, the cork wouldn't match up. So I figured, hey, let's just go ahead and put in the uh, Amboy engine facility now. So that's what I'm doing here is I'm putting in the uh, sub road bed for the uh, engine facility. So So you notice there is a little upslope in the uh, the subroad bed for the facility. Um, it does, it's not too critical here because you know we're just going to be moving uh, locomotives in and out, so we don't have to worry about too high grades. Also, the engine facility was up a little high, um, and it sloped down on each side, so that's why I wanted it a little higher. Um, on, on the backdrop in behind the facility, we're going to be putting in the coal dumper, and probably that space right there where you see the coal train parked right above that will be the coal thawing facility. And here is the uh, rough outline of the engine facility. Okay, and so here we are uh, continuing to lay our cork so we can get all our cork road bed down. You know, Brown's Yard is going to be the focal point of the layout here because all the trains on the layout are going to originate here from Brown's Yard. So it's pretty critical that, you know, I get this yard to operate properly. I don't want to have to be dealing with derailments and, and bad curves and stuff. So I'm really paying attention here to what we're doing and making sure everything is nice and um, level and smooth. So uh, Conrail, Coltrane, UDK is uh, coming through uh, the area. Um, you know, it's really nice and enjoyable to have trains running while you're working. Uh, you just got to be mindful that you don't knock stuff over. Uh, that happened a couple times. But um, again, it it's just keeps your focus and it allows you to take a step back and relax. So I thought the best 
step for this process was to just lay the cork and let it hang over the edge. And now we're going to come back and we're going to trim it right up next to the sub road bed. Um, I just thought that would be the best way to make sure we get the glue right to the edge and it doesn't kind of lift up. So while I'm in the mode of laying uh, cork, we're just going to continue right up into the engine facility and get all that cork down. Okay, so let's talk about the engine facility. You know, I really wanted some kind of engine servicing area for my layout just to display my logos. Um, you know. The Amboy engine facility, don't forget, was five miles to the east of Brown's yard. It wasn't even connected, but I kind of molded it into the yard uh, to fit the track plan so that it could have what I wanted and still make sense and, and be functional. Okay, so let me apologize for these next few scenes. I thought I was going to be slick and I was going to use my digital SLR to do some video footage and you know make it look a little different and try something. And I guess these this aperture settings were wrong. Um, so just bear with me because I thought these scenes were important because it's the first track uh, that we're laying in Brown's yard. So while you're watching me lay track, uh, let me put my two cents in here. You know, there is a specific tool for specific jobs. Why the digital SLR is really good for taking still photography and it does do video, I don't think it does a, as good a job as my camcorder. You know, by design, I think that the video function of a digital SLR was kind of an afterthought. You know, the focusing motor doesn't work as quickly, so you keep noticing that jerky motion where with my video camera, it's nice and smooth. So keep that in mind when you're, uh, you know, shopping around for cameras. Um, you know, if, I know cost is a factor and everybody's trying to save money, but that's just what you need to realize is a digital SLR that the, the images aren't going to be as smooth as a video camera. Okay, so here we are relating track for track four and five. So, you know, I planned out the yard on paper uh, a couple times and I checked a lot of stuff and um, when we got down to putting it in on the plywood I realized that some of the curves were really too tight for um, you know for the yard I thought that I was gonna be able to pull it off but when I started bending the curves oh my god that's way too sharp also the turnouts were way too close so I wanted to avoid derailments of problems so I extended that ladder out so you can notice there's those big long curves bef after each turnout so that's why we lost some capacity you know, losing capacity, I would rather have lost some car space to have the yard operate smoothly. So that's why there was these changes and there's those big sweeping curves. So consequently, by making that change on the fly, you know, we did lose some capacity. We lost about 10 to 15 car capacity in the yard. However, at the end, when you look at the pictures, all the trains at the end are in the yard and we still have a lot of room. So that's really promising. You know, so that just takes me back to my focal point here that I've been putting out to you through this whole video series. Is you need to be able to make sacrifices and changes on the fly uh, in order to have a good operating layout. You know, making that change of, of extending that ladder out, it, it makes the yard operate so much smoother, so much better, and uh, it's not going to create problems during an op session. So just be mindful of when you're going from paper to plywood, you know, be willing to make those sacrifices, you know, for the sake of operations. Okay, so before I get any further on the ladder, I'm, I'm gluing that spot down there because it's kind of a, a pivot point. So every time I was trying to bend the track, the turnout was moving. So I figured let's just glue it down and weigh it down now so I can continue working. So even notice I'm soldering my turnouts. Uh, I've gotten a lot of questions uh, lately about soldering turnouts, and I definitely think you should solder your turnouts in. Number one, it, it creates a good joint. So when you're moving, bending the track, it doesn't misalign the turnout. Secondly, it does create good 
uh, electric conductivity and it makes for a smoother running turnout. So yes, uh, I do solder all my turnouts. I'm just adding more track to the uh, section to extend it out all the way through the yard, uh, making sure my joints are all nice, um, we're filing all the burrs off, uh, fitting in our rail joiners, and making sure everything's nice and neat. So, uh, again, this will make for a cleaner operation. So even though I try to clean up the work area as I go, um, you know, before I start gluing down track, I want to make sure I get up uh, and vacuum everything again, just to make sure it's nice and clean. Because uh, you don't want any little bits of metal or, or sawdust getting stuck under the track, because it'll make bumps and uh, it may uh, affect your running uh, of all your freight cars. Again, so my adhesive of choice for my track is going to be DAP uh, latex caulk. It's the clear one. Um, I find that this is working out really well. Um, you know, if you do have to move track, you just put in your uh, putty knife underneath the track and very gently pull it up, and uh, you can uh, get the track up. So uh, I think it's a really good choice for uh, gluing your track down. So throughout the construction of the layout, I've decided that using the soup cans are like a really great idea for weighing your track down. They're plentiful, they're upstairs in the kitchen, and uh, you know they, they're perfect to fit on the rails. Getting ready to install this next turnout. Um, you know, I want to take the time to talk about frogs. Uh, I've been powering all my frogs, and I really believe in it. I think putting electrical power to that frog and then using the tortoise to switch polarity, I think it makes the turnout run so much smoother, and my locomotives really like it. You know, when the power, frogs aren't powered, I notice there is a hesitation as the, the locomotive goes through a frog. So definitely think about that if you're using the, uh, the microengineering turnouts. doing so good and I just knocked some cars over with the uh, soldering iron so so here we are uh, putting the curve into the back track track 10 and that's gonna be kind of where we spot our loads to go on the scale track and also the access for the engine facility so even though track 10 is pretty large, it's not going to be used for a whole lot of space because we do need that little um, space for the engines to get in to get to that turnout to head into the uh, facility. So the more I play around with the yard, I think yeah, we're just going to stick the hoppers back there for the scale and maybe uh, put my cabooses in there and use that as like a caboose track. So I think that's what it will end up doing with track 10. So I'm going to 
glue this little section in here because again it's a pivot point so every time I'm trying to work on the track in the yard it keeps moving these turnouts out of position so I'm gonna glue them down and weigh them down and uh, so we can continue working. <laughs> Okay, so there we go. We knocked over some more cars. Uh, I'm not going to play around now. We're moving everything out of the yard. Uh, I don't need any more equipment hitting the deck here. We already broke a bunch of stuff. So, uh, yeah, we'll just get this stuff out of the way. What do they say? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of flesh? So it's moving day, the yard's open for business, so uh, we're going to start moving all our trains in. So this is the SA31, SA35, SA37, SA37 Extra, SA39, and the SA02. And as you can see, once it's all in here, we have plenty of room. Okay, so here we are getting started on the engine facility. So I'm going to bring that track in up the incline there. Um, you can see the curve section there where my hand's resting, that's gonna be the scale track. Uh, I got that all in. There's a curved turnout at the end of that uh, line to tie it into the facility. So the first turnout uh, going into the facility is gonna be a Y. I use the 2.5 Y, it's an Atlas Code 55. I did that because number one, I had it. Number two, it shortened up the ladder a little bit because by design, the Ys are shorter. So uh, I think it's going to work out pretty good. Yes, yeah, so I guess it comes with experience, but if you notice, I put the glue down and I put the track assembly in, and now I'm soldering it. This way, uh, I don't have to bend that short little section up to get the glue underneath. Okay, so here we are getting started uh, measuring for the inspection pits. I wanted inspection pits inside the engine facility uh, just to make it look good. Um, I could have scratch built them, but I decided to go with the Pico uh, kits. Uh, actually, the kit went together really nice. Um, there are some problems with the track though. We'll talk about that in a minute. So now I'm using my router to uh, route out the slot for the inspection pit. This killed me. There was dust everywhere. I forgot how much dust gets thrown out by the router. So uh, we were cleaning for a couple days after this. It So in the directions, they didn't really talk about how deep to make the, the slot for the uh, for the pit. So I measured it. I came out with uh, like 730 seconds. Um, and then I found out that wasn't deep enough. So I had to route down, I think it was 1330 seconds. Um, so you'll notice I was me I'm measuring with a, uh, a scale ruler. Um, so I would just, I have no recommendation on what to do with that. Uh, just kind of play it by ear and uh, test fit it. So the first one I did a lot of changes in my uh, measurements, uh, but on the second pit I knew what the measurements were because it was already set on my router and I just burnt the hole and it fit right in. So this is where these uh, mock-up buildings really come in uh, handy. I know what the general measurements are. I can use that so I know for the spacing of the pits and the, the alignment for the doors. So that really um, is key with these mock-ups. Secondly, if I do need to tweak the mock-up, um, I will have the measurements so when I start scratch building, I know the exact measurements that I need. Here we are routing the slot for the second inspection pit. And the cleanup begins. So uh, yeah, I guess this is pretty much the last time I gotta do major 
construction where there's going to be dust everywhere like this. So that I'm very happy about that because it's just there are dust gets everywhere. Okay, so let's talk about these Pico pits. So if you look at this rail, there's this double webbing on the bottom, and it, you can't get the rail joiner in, to, uh, in position to make the uh, rail match up properly. So what I had to do was use my Dremel tool and burn off that bottom webbing, and then it fit. Of course, the instructions that come with these inspection pits, they're not very in-depth, so they don't tell you how to do this. A lot of people um, don't even use the rail that comes with the pit. They just uh, strip off code 55 rail and then feed it through. Or these pits can also be used with code 80. So uh, you know, you kind of go out there and read. I know uh, Tyler Whitmore just put a bunch of them in on the uh, Torino and Western, and he was telling me uh, through Facebook that he just used his own code 55 rail to go straight through. So of course. That's after the fact, and I uh, sh should have done a little more research before. So hopefully I can help you if you want to use these pits, because they're very nice models. They're very detailed. They go together really well. It's just that rail is, is the only problem. So the first track that I put through, I trimmed it to the edge of the sub road bed. But then if you notice, I start leaving it hanging over the edge. So I was thinking in my head, maybe when I get senior in, I can kind of cheat and get that, that little extra space to fit in a couple, like another locomotive on each track. So that's why I'm leaving that, that rail hanging like that. So initial testing, it looks like I'm going to fit about 15 locomotives in the whole facility. You know, maybe if I could get like three more or so in, that would be really nice. But uh, if not, you know, 15 is still good. So I'm happy, very happy with the way that it came out. So track one, two, and four, uh, I cut um, insulation joints. And uh, that was so that I can power off each track so I don't have to have the locomotive sitting there running the whole time. Track three, I couldn't cut an, an insulation gap because of that curve. Every time I did, it would spring out. I did it a couple times. Uh, you, you don't see that in the video. I, I edited it out. But so uh, track three is just going to have to be powered all the time. So that mock up there that's standing up that, that looks like a coal tower. Um, it was a coal tower, but the Pensy converted over to sand. So I made sure to include it in the facility because they were using it right up to the facility it was closed. So I'm very excited to bring this uh, facility back to life because the facility was closed and, and bulldozed in the mid 80s. Um, P, the Pensy used this uh, as a change out location for their steam locomotives and their electric, then it was turned over to um, to Jersey Transit and Jersey Transit did the same they changed their diesels for electrics for the run into New York City so you know no not many people have seen this uh, facility uh, you know there's a lot of pictures uh, from the 70s but you know in modern times people have forgotten I mean it's an open field now so really looking forward to bringing this back to life so that people can see it and that wraps up our construction Okay, so there you have it. That's how we put it together. So um, let's talk about Brown's Yard. So, um, you know, 
I know I've been talking and in my year in review and my Christmas video, I said, you know, end of January, end of January, but you know, um, like I said, uh, it, in the construction point where we're doing a cork, I'm like, you know, I want the cork to seamlessly go right into the engine facility. So I'm like, well, let's just get working on the engine facility. And then I got running away with myself and I'm, you know, cause I was so amped up to get that going. Um, I just kept on going. So that's part of the reason why this video is a, a couple weeks late uh, is because, you know, we, we went ahead and did all that. So it's a little, um, little more uh, work. And, um, but the outcome is, um, uh, very good. Uh, I'm I'm very very happy right now. Um, you know, I indicated in the video, um, and so I don't want to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but I think it's a key point we got to remember here is when you're taking your track plan and you're going to the bench work, you need to remember that you need to be able to make changes and sacrifices. So sacrifice is number one because you know it is your baby and you want it a certain way, but you know when you start laying it out. It, it, if it doesn't look right, don't don't do it. Don't force it because you're going to be very unhappy with the outcome. Um, you know, it's not going to run right. Trains are going to derail, and it's not going to make sense. So be willing to make sacrifices. Eliminate um, areas that aren't needed. Um, be willing to make changes to the track configuration, like in the yard. So we did lose a little bit of capacity, about 10 cars, but the yard uh, operates so much better, and uh, it was a good choice I think in my point just taking the ladder and instead of putting the secondary turnouts right next to the ladder I brought that track out and, and curved it out and put the turnout back here so this way there's more space for the car before it hits the points because um, what I'm learning through this whole process two and a half years is when you put these turnouts too close to the to the curves, especially with code 55, maybe with code 80 you might get away with it, but code 55 is so particular that when the turnout is so close to a, a, a curve that the, tr the the freight cars and the locomotives are not recentering coming out of the curve before they hit that point to diverge, and it just it, it's playing ha it was playing havoc. There's a couple turnouts that are going to have to be tweaked and adjusted. I may even have to pull up some track and relay it if I can't uh, get it to work properly. So that's what I'm uh, that's what I want to drive home with you is when you're getting into your layout is be willing to make those changes and do it on the fly. That that's the biggest piece of advice I can give you from two and a half years of experience of putting this together. So I hope uh, I hope I drove that point home. So all right, enough of that. Let's uh let's not beat the dead horse. Let's go on um into our next point. So as in, also as I indicated in that, that video, um, you know, Browns Yard is the focal point here. Uh, all operations are going to be based out of Browns Yard. So all those trains are going to originate here with the exception of the OI-16 and the uh, CA-53. They're going to originate off the layout and terminate here. So uh, we had to make sure that, you know, that the, the yard operates smoothly and we have enough capacity to bring in all those cars. And, uh, you know, you can still see over my shoulder here that there's, there's a lot of room. Uh, I still got two open tracks in here. Now, granted, I do have one more train. Uh, that's going to be the SA-42, which is going to be for the Amboy Secondary to go through that hole in the wall there. And that's going to be coming uh, probably within the next six months or so because uh, we got a lot on our plate coming up, and I'll explain shortly. So, yeah, so Browns here is only about 95% complete, and that is because of this panel here, and it's going to be a bear. Um, so, let's see, panel-wise. Um, English Town, Jamesburg, and Sarahville running track, fully operational, up and running. Amboy Secondary... Uh, excuse me, the Amboy engine facility, parts are on order. That should be coming in in about a week. We'll get that wrapped up. And then we're gonna dive into this panel. This panel's gonna be a lot of work, big big job. Uh, but we're looking at like 14, 15 turnouts on this panel. So um, yeah, I got it. it's, it's gonna be a little bit of money and uh, a lot of work. So uh, time frame right now is the end of February to have all these panels up and running. And, uh, but you know, the yard, yard's operational. Fully, it's all powered. Um, Amboy engine facility is all powered. Um, you know, just the turnouts is what we're waiting for. You could still, I left the springs in the bottom of the turnouts so we can still operate them manually. And then what I do is when I come to do the, the uh, tortoise and fit it underneath, I just pop out that spring with an with a X-Acto knife and push it down through the hole and then put the tortoise in. So, you know, I can still get in here. We can still switch and uh, that's good because I'll tell you what's coming up next. So Amboy engine facility, let's talk about it. I don't, I don't know if it, my point's going to come out in the video because I didn't have much time to, to talk about it. So I touched upon it. Um, Amboy engine facility. So originally, first of all, it, like I said, it's five miles to the east, not even connected with Browns Yard. Initially, it was built as a Pennsylvania Railroad facility. And during the 50s, what would happen was steam would run up the Jersey coastline 
well, um, up to from Bayhead. And in South Aaron Boy, they would take the steam locomotives off and change them out for electrics because you couldn't take steam all the way into New York City. So the electric faci uh, facility was at uh, Amboy uh, engine facility. So then when the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, merged and became the Penn Central, um, it was turned over to Penn Central and steam was phased out and they started using uh, diesel. So diesel from Bayhead up and then change out for electric for the run into New York City. So then Conrail came wrong and con Conrail continued the operations from about you know, 1976 up till about 1981, 82-ish when uh, Jersey Transit was formed and then the facility was ha formally handed over to Jersey Transit. However, you know, there were still some Conrail locomotives spotted in the facility up to about 85 or so. There's a lot of pictures of it. So that's why I've, I've taken and run, run with it. Um, like I said, I wanted an engine facility. There was some Conrail power in there. You know, don't forget Conrail was doing all the commuter operations right up until Jersey Transit. So there was a lot of E8s that were in Conrail Blue. Um, they also still had the, uh, the electric motor service facility where they serviced the GG1s and E33s. So, um, you know, it's, that's, that's the history of it. So if you go into the rail fan sites like uh, railroadarchives.net um, and, and just search South Amboy, um, you know, get a lot of pictures of the facility. Uh, there was a lot of rail fans back in the 70s that were taking tons and tons of pictures. But, you know, sadly in, in you know, 85, uh, Jersey Transit moved their facility uh, up to the Meadowlands. Um, they didn't need it, so they bulldozed it, and it's gone. Uh, there's just an open field there, and in fact, the last time I looked on uh, Google Earth, it was a, a sand facility now. So... Um, you know, I think it's very vital uh, for uh, New Jersey Railroad history is to remember that facility. And, you know, the, the generation of rail fans that are out there now, um, they don't know what I'm talking about. They, you know, it's, it's a bygone era. So I'm very excited to be able to bring this facility back. And I thought tying it into the Browns yard and we're going to use it as, as Conrail, uh, you know, I think. But I'm still sticking with the flavor of the prototype. So, um, you know, just... It's a little bit of history, so I'm very happy with the way it's coming out. I think it's gonna, uh, I'm gonna pull it off pretty good. So, so last point about uh, Amboy engine facility. You know, uh, I had to condense the facility a little bit. Um, out the back of the engine house, there was a uh, the four tracks all came together at a point uh, right up next to the to the uh, jetty, uh, the rock jetty uh, for the Raritan Bay. You know, it was a real pitch, picturesque scene. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't even come close to fitting that. So. We got about one or two engine lengths out of the back of the uh, engine house, and then I cut it off. Um, the other thing is I really wanted to put the electric, motive, uh, the electric motor service facility in, the two-track inspection pit, but uh, it, it wasn't going to fit into the track plan, so I had to nix that. However, I think I'm going to try and see if I can do some kind of static display uh, off to the side of it, but there's no way I'm going to be able to, t to tie it into the, to the, uh, the track plan and have it operate. So... Um, maybe just like a static display and I can put a couple GG1s in there for, uh, for display purposes. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, as we get the scenery, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. So as I'm standing in front of you, um, it's official. Uh, the crews have been called. Uh, the date has been set. Uh, March 10th is going to be our first operation session. So, you know, uh, a lot of you out there are looking at the layout and like, why are you even calling people to come look at this mess? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I want to get guys in here, or guys and gals, excuse me. I want to get people in here and start operating this layout and, and make final tweaks and tests before I get into scenery because I don't want to be spending so much time on putting stru building structures and scenery and then have to tear it all up because, you know, this turnout's out of position. So, you know, want to get at least two op sessions in. I'm going to look at the March, uh, March 10th one and then our April one before I start scenery, um, you know, uh, start constructing scenery probably in May time frame. So that's what you can look forward to. Now, still gonna make some videos, got a lot of video ideas. Uh, you know, we gotta do a lot of ops videos and get caught up because I know my big, my fans out there for the ops videos have probably been waiting in the wings, like what's going on. Um, so now that this work's being wrapped up, I'm gonna focus on getting ready for the ops session on March 10th. And then right after the March 10th uh, op session, I'm going to get right into making videos. I want to, maybe I'll produce a video uh, for ops uh, before the session. Um, but, you know, right after that, I'm kind of focusing all my energy because now that the date is looming, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. We need a dispatcher display board. Oh, I need another throttle. Uh, I need radios. Uh, you know, there's all these things are coming up and I'm like, oh, geez, I never, you know, starting to think about all this stuff because the date's coming up and, uh, 
I want to focus my time because the people who are taking the time out to come to my op session, I want them to enjoy it. I don't want it to be a big mess. But, you know, I talked to Tony Bone on Facebook. Um, you know, I don't want to set the bar too high. I don't want to put my expectations up here because then I'll be crushed because that's just my personality. So I'm going to just dial it back a little bit and I'm going to expect that halfway through the session, we're going to be like, this is a nightmare. We're going to turn it off and we're just going to watch movies. So, you know, that's, that's the expectation that I'm setting. So if anything above that, I'll be ecstatic. So, um, yeah. So, but I'm going to produce a video for you and uh, we'll see how it all comes out and plays out. So stay tuned for that. And um, very exciting time for me. Uh, you know, two and a half years I've been talking about op sessions and uh, it's really starting to happen. I got my crew uh, uh, notified and they're, they're, they're responding back. So uh, I think it's going to be a good time. So uh, what can you expect from me on YouTube, uh, out there, my YouTube followers? Um, you know, don't forget, uh, February 21st, YouTube Model Builders Live. I'm going to be back with Bill Graham and uh, Barry um, and John. So, uh, you know, we're going to be working on another locomotive this time. Um, then uh, after that, we'll look for ops videos coming up. Uh, panel's done for Sayreville, so actually I'm probably going to get started on that video, is uh, operating the YJ SAO2. So I can show you how, how to run that. And um, then we're going to get into uh, the rail fan video and uh, also start playing around with the OI-16 and CA-53. So uh, look for those videos coming up. And then uh, probably after uh, the, Mar the March op session, uh, you know, I really wanted to get it out before my session, but, you know, time frame is it's crunch time. And uh, so I'm going to put the mock session that we're going to do together uh, afterwards. Because here's, here's my plan for that, uh, just to give you a teaser. I'm going to record the whole session. Uh, I'm going to do a whole four hour session or even six hours or eight hours, however long it takes. I'm going to do it all by myself and I'm going to break it into videos and then we're going to have a big blowout release and I'll just do a, a video per day. So, you know, you guys can expect that's what you can expect to come out. So uh, more details to follow on that. So stay tuned. And then one more video that I'm going to promise you I'm going to get out before the op session because I think it's very important for, for all my followers is I'm going to do an update video because I know there's a lot of little projects that I've been working on behind the scenes that you haven't seen uh, on YouTube. So I want to go back and I want to show you, you know, uh, pay the, the, what the staging art looks like now that it's all painted up and, and cleaned up. Uh, the electronics portions I put in my programming track and you know et cetera et cetera the, the, the dispatcher display board and I'll, I'm going to go through and, and just take you on a walking tour show you where the status of layout is so you can see all these little projects that I've been doing on the side and uh, that's kind of got lost in the translation so uh, definitely 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 going to get that out for you before March 10th and so uh, with that you know big milestone it's kind of a little uh, tearjerker actually now that I'm standing here doing it in front of the camera is uh, the con major construction is done um, yes we still have that little portion over there, but in this this root layout room here, I'm putting the saw away, putting the saw horses away. No more dust, no more vacuuming, no more cleaning. Uh, it's time to concentrate on doing scenery. So, yeah, uh, it's been fun. I hope everybody picked up a, a, picked up a lot in, in watching me do it, watching my mistakes, watching my successes, and uh, I've I, I you know you, a lot of you out there have told me, but I, I really hope that I've inspired a lot of you to you know. Get, get, get your layout started, and also I hope I've helped a lot of you put your layout together. And, uh, you know, it was, it's been a, you know, a long process, and uh, we're here, we're standing here, and uh, I'm going to call it done. We're done. So, um, I'm going to end on that note. Um, that's all I have for you this time on Central Jersey Conrail Landscale. Uh, keep an eye on the channel. Watch out for our scenery uh, playlist when, it's, when we start that. And otherwise, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.